as this. And we're recording your talk. Excellent. Thanks a lot. So hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be presenting at um, Cambridge. It's unfortunate that I can be there uh, myself during um, other obligations. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor. It's only actually a few months um, since I was uh, at the judge uh, business school. Uh, so hopefully next, next presentation can be in person. Uh, so a few words about who I am. Um, like Gina said, uh, my name is Kabak, so you can call me Stelios. I've been in the world of data science for a very long time, did my PhD in UCL. I'm still affiliated with UCL through the Blockchain Center. I'm also a data science advisor at London Business School. And I've spent a good part of my career simplifying data science and dealing with the soft parts of data science and AI. Things like data strategy, business models for data science, and I've also published a book. Uh, if anyone wants to go on my website or send me an email, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to share a PDF of my book with you. Um, so what uh, we're going to talk uh, about in this short presentation is we're going to talk about entrepreneurship in data science and AI. And more specifically, we're going to talk about some of the things we've learned over the last 10, 15 years about business models in this area. Uh, so I assume that if you're in this room or if you're watching online, then you're interested in entrepreneurship and you either want to start a new company um, or you're already part of a new company. Maybe you have a technical skill set. Maybe you want to start a company in AI, or maybe you want to create a company that where data is going to be a strong part of our data science and AI. And quite frankly, these days it's inevitable. So at some point, you'll have to deal with data. So if, when, when data science and AI startups first started like, let's say, becoming more popular and, and, and growing, there were many things that we, we didn't know. Okay? And, uh, and I hope that this presentation is going to help you avoid some of the mistakes that me, myself, <laughs> have, have done in the past and some of the mistakes that I've seen other entrepreneurs doing in, uh, in the past. Um, so one thing which I believe everyone is familiar with, whether they are uh, part of the data science and AI community or whether they're not, is that data science and AI, they're very hot topics and investment is constantly rising. And uh, the UK and especially London are some of the best places for AI after the US. Uh, China is trying to get ahead of the race, both in terms of a number of startups and business applications, but also in terms of academic research. But at the same time, we see that there are more and more uh, countries and more and more verticals across the world adopting data science just at different speeds. At the same time, we're still witnessing a shortage of data scientists, which uh, means that data scientists are still um, getting compensated quite well, and this is still a very lucrative uh, job. And I don't think that we're going to see this trend slowing down for the next five or even 10 or 15 years, given that as more and more places, more and more verticals are becoming data-driven, we'll also start seeing synergies between technologies like IoT and blockchain. So now let's move on to talk about the different business models in data science. Okay, so roughly there are three different um, business models. And I'd say I have we're the honor of having been involved in each and every one of them in one way or another. Is that trying things myself or uh, consulting and advising for other companies? So we have software, deep tech, and services. Okay. So in the software model, uh, the goal is to create some kind of SaaS product or similar. Okay, which uh, which is a very good tried and tested business model. Um, the deep tech model assumes that uh, you have some knowledge that others do not have, maybe you're a PhD researcher in a very niche topic. And the business model is around making one fundamental innovation and selling this innovation. And finally, it's the services model, which is the lowest barriers to, to, to entry model. If you've taken any courses from JADS, maybe you've, um, you've also studied the consulting business model a bit more, uh, which is also the more, um, you know, one of the most common 
uh, models in, in entrepreneurship. Um, so one, uh, each one of those models um, which one has its own challenges, right? So the deep tech business model for data science and AI is something that I've seen um, that more and more researchers uh, are going for. Okay, and there are some domains, for example, such as biotech, where it's actually an amazing domain uh, because there's so um, there's so many things involved in research in, for example, pharmaceuticals, biology, etc. Um, but it's very difficult for other research groups or let's say companies to copy what you're doing. Sometimes you can even patent it. In data science and AI, uh, this model is a bit more challenging. Um, first of all, one of the reasons it's challenging is that you assume you put all your eggs in one basket, right? So you assume that you have some kind of innovation um, which no one else can replicate and there's going to be a big market for this, okay? Um, first of all, this is not actually something that most people can do, even if they actually have a PhD in machine learning, because you still need to specialize in something which no one else is doing. And in software and maths, this is way more difficult than it sounds. So I've seen over the years, um, many PhDs, at least that's what I had seen in UCL, try to transition towards this model, um, particularly because if you execute this model correctly, you don't have to develop other skills as an entrepreneur. So if you become an entrepreneur, you might have to learn how to do sales. You might have to learn how to do marketing. You might have to learn how to manage people. And if you actually execute this well, maybe, you know, you're just, um, your company is just a team of three, four, five people. You come up with an algorithm and then you can sell this. Uh, but in practice, in software, this is not as common as it used to be. Right. So I remember, for example, 10 years ago, there were companies trying to specialize in computer vision, this and that. You can't really compete with Google anymore, right? You can't compete with AWS, you can't compete with, uh, with Azure. So if you're going for this, you probably have to join this model with some kind of niche in some other science or domain. So maybe you want to combine AI, um, I don't know, with medicine or something of this kind. In this case, it, it can work. Um, but again, it's it's a fairly challenging, uh, fairly challenging topic, and you know the rule book is still being written. Plus, this you know you don't have much room to maneuver. If this doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's it. You have to come up with a new innovation. Very difficult. Then the services is the exact opposite, right? So anyone who studied uh, different types of business models, they'll tell you that services and consulting, um, low barriers to entry, difficult to scale. Um, you know you have to spend lots of time doing sales and in marketing, and an additional challenge with uh, data science is that it's opaque. So it's not like designing websites. Um, it's not easy to communicate. Even if you use graphs, you still need to have skills in storytelling. So I'd say that actually consulting in data science, uh, it's more difficult than consulting in other computer-related services. And I'm saying this having been in this area for quite a few uh, years. I think it's frustrating at, at times. And finally, where most companies gravitate towards do is software, right? Uh, they gravitate towards software and they try to build some uh, SaaS solution on a cloud. And it makes perfect sense, right? SaaS is an established model, it can scale very well, um, but this is where many things go wrong. And there's this amazing article by Anderson Horowitz. Um, it's one of the few articles that you're gonna find that where they explicitly talk about business models in AI, the reason being that there are very few people or companies or organizations studying AI business models because it is such a new topic. But this article is very enlightening. And uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to summarize it for you and give you my own opinion of this. And again, I think anyone who wants to create a business in this area or a business with a strong data component, they need to learn from this 100% because I've seen people making these mistakes again and again, I've done some of this myself. Essentially what they say is that uh, most AI businesses that try to build a SaaS product because it can scale very well, but AI businesses, they can never really be pure SaaS businesses. And they actually have the data to prove this. Okay, uh, you don't have to read this whole paragraph. I'm gonna break it down for you in the next few slides. But essentially they say that AI businesses compared to SaaS businesses, pure SaaS, um, let's say something like Dropbox or something like this or, or accounting software, uh, they have lower gross margins, they have scaling challenges and they have weaker defensive uh, modes. Mode. 
So let me break this down for you. So the traditional SaaS model has super high margins, right? So you just build the software on the cloud. Uh, you can ask for a price anywhere between $30 to $200, I guess, for most SaaS uh, soft, types of software. And it's, it, it can scale very, very well. It can scale very well, and then you can build a mode uh, around the technology. You can build a mode around your, um, your users. Then services is the other, the other end of the spectrum, right? In services, it's difficult to build a high margin. Uh, there's always some bespoke component. There are longer sales cycles. Marketing usually is not enough. And it's usually linear scaling at best. And AI businesses sit in between. And this might sound kind of intuitive unless you're a data scientist yourself. So those of you who, have, you know, who are not data scientists, maybe they're like, okay, why is this case? I don't understand. So the problem is that AI businesses, um, usually AI projects usually require a bespoke component because the, the main reason usually is data extraction. Okay, There are no data standards in most fields in the world, which means that at some point of this pipeline, you need a human who knows what they're doing and they're there to extract the data, uh, clean it up, understand the business, et cetera, et cetera. And this is an additional overhead which actually prevents uh, companies, like AI companies, from scaling, okay? So you can still try to build a SaaS, an, a, an AI SaaS product, but it's very likely that for every client that you work with, uh, you are going to need a consultant who's actually going to install the SaaS and maybe do some data work, okay? So this is why AI businesses sit in between, which means as you acquire more clients, um, you also need to hire additional people to do this kind of work. Then something is going to happen. You need to make changes to the software, and then this thing compounds. Okay, so the margins are usually are the better than services, but they are not SaaS. Then other uh, issues uh, that many AI companies they have very um, many issues around cloud. Uh, machine learning models are data hungry. They are also hungry in terms of resources. Um, and then this is a cost that you somehow have to manage, right? And sometimes you might have to pass this over to your clients. So I remember a quote from an automated machine learning company, which was, I don't know, they told me something crazy, like $10,000 their processing core. Um, anyway, it's, it's, you know, it, it's essentially, they followed the business model because of this computational cost, which already excluded 90% of the market, okay? Simply because, they had this cloud cost, they had to pass this over to their clients so they could only work with enterprise, big enterprises. Another issue connected to the previous point around services, which I mentioned here, another issue is that many AI applications require a human in the loop, um, for example, to label data points, okay? And there's some ways to make this more efficient by using websites like Mechanical Turk, et cetera. But again, this is one more scaling um, challenge. Okay, and this pretty much summarizes the point I, I mentioned earlier that many AI businesses, I've done this myself, I've seen this how they're doing it, they start by saying, look, we operate in this domain, uh, we can use AI to completely automate this pipeline, and then we can scale very easily. And this is usually not the case. You get your first client, you, you see things were not as you expected, then you get your next client after that, you see there are issues with their data, you need to adapt the software. Um, and there are many, many things which can take place, which means that you have to hire additional people, you need to make adaptations to the software. Um, and I've seen many, and I actually have, you know, at least a very good example of a successful company that managed to, to scale by balancing these two um, objectives, creating software and, and consulting. Uh, but quite often you see, you know, companies which uh, start off with a the software, they end up consulting and many other companies that never really get it and, and crash, right? And obviously you can understand that these challenges, they obviously affect your ability to raise investment, right? So if, for example, Anderson Horowitz is saying, um, look, AI is a big opportunity, but you have these issues in scaling. If you actually want to try raise capital, this is something that you have to address with uh, investors, right? So if, if, if for example, the, the thesis of a certain VC is that, look, we actually need to see this kind of growth curve, it's very likely that you may not be able to achieve this kind of growth following an AI business model. And no matter the attractiveness of this, um, of this area. And, and, and uh, finally, some other issues around the, the mode, like when you build a business, you always want to have a competitive advantage. Uh, 
we still there are many there are still many things we don't know about modes in in AI businesses. But I think one fundamental drawback is that AI software it's not that difficult to copy. Um, you know, maybe some of you are old enough to remember the days before the internet where knowledge was more difficult to share. Now everything is open. Uh, AI is dominated by big research groups and big companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, AWS, they're doing lots of work in this space. So, it, and they also have most of the data. So it's very unlikely you're just going to create something with someone who will have zero chance of replicating. And quite often some of the modes I've seen some AI businesses building quite ironically are around their business network or the territory, right? So maybe they're the first in some country or region and they achieve dominance through their connections and build up case studies. This gives more faith in their abilities to other, uh, let's say, investors and prospects, etc. And then they scale like this, which again demonstrates this services component, okay, which might not be as interesting. And another challenge which I've seen many entrepreneurs face in, the, in this space is that you have a team of data scientists and when they have to deal with these issues of scaling, selling, marketing, um, sometimes they find this challenge quite often because maybe they're even their personality is not suited to this type of um, let's say to this type of work. So the thing is that there are quite a few solutions to this problem, and still, investment in AI startups is growing and growing because, in spite of their problems, AI and in general the the wider let's say family of technologies they add they add huge value to society and into businesses, and that's why investors are going to keep throwing money uh, at this. Right. So I think one of the key learnings is that it's important to eliminate model complexity. I've seen uh, it's actually quite funny because I've studied some companies in the space of automated machine learning and analytics, which is a space that's been going for, let's say, 10 years and now it's breaking into the mainstream. And I see that their innovation in this space is not around the technology or the methods. It's only around the user experience. <laughs> uh, which gives food for thought, right? So maybe you don't need to, to get a group of data scientists, maybe you need one data scientist and then a, a bunch of product people. Uh, you have to choose problem domains uh, carefully and narrow. Okay, so that's something else. I mentioned earlier, maybe it's a good idea to focus, to create an AI-based solution for a particular domain. Uh, this quite often can be a winning strategy, especially if this domain is something like medicine that it actually requires specialized knowledge and it's, it's, it's frankly, it's not that difficult. It's not that easy for anyone to understand it. So if someone tries to replicate this, that need to compile resources from different domains in order to tackle this. Um, then a uh, plan for high variable costs, which this refers to the cloud costs and brace services um, and what this means. So I don't think there's, um, you know, I don't think there's a way around understanding maybe some Top, you know, deciding how to sell, how to market. Uh, when you create an AI business, you're most likely not going to um, meet a situation um, like Facebook, where people will just want to join your platform out of nowhere because this has reached the critical mass. Everyone loves your product. And that's not social media. Um, you constantly have to sell and build uh, case studies. Uh, plan for a change in tech stack, which is uh, one challenge that many tech businesses. Um, face and then finally build defensibility, you know, in the old fashioned way, which means have the right product market fit, uh, case study, this sort of thing. So I hope you found this helpful. I hope that there are going to be at least one person in this audience who's going to learn something from this, avoid <laughs> some of these mistakes which people have spent years of their lives making. Um, thank you. And uh, I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you, Stelios.